Against overwhelming firepower, three British ships took on the pride of the German fleet, the pocket battleship Graf Speer. It would become known as the Battle of the River Plate. The battle would pit two great naval officers against each other in a deadly duel. Graf Spee was commanded by Captain Hans Langsdorff, a decorated hero from the First World War. Thousand men. A thousand men owe their lives to Langsdorff. Langsdorff, your life. Facing him was Commodore Henry Harwood, a brilliant naval tactician. He had a happy knack of getting results by being nice. People trusted him. As the world watched, the battle moved ashore in a gripping story of deception and one of the biggest bluffs of the Second World War. One of the commanders would be decorated and returned home a hero. The other would lose his ship, his reputation and eventually his life. In this battle, we have good versus evil, weak versus strong, the weak triumph over the strong. But the strong is represented by a good man fighting for an evil cause. He pays the price of this impossible situation. It's a tragedy that most playwrights could make a great deal from. Tonight, Time Watch re-examines the evidence and tells the full story of the Battle of the River Plate. The Admiral Graf Spee was the pride of the German Navy. Even before the Second World War had begun, she was central to secret plans for a guerre de course, a war against commerce at sea. A special ship would need a special captain. The man chosen was one of the best and most highly respected officers in the German Navy, Captain Hans Langsdorff. The great thing about Langsdorff was that he was a very gentlemanly officer. He was a very old-style naval officer. And he was a very attractive figure as well. Langsdorff came from a family of lawyers and Lutheran pastors and had been brought up in a strict moral tradition. Das heißt also, das christliche Weltbild spielte eine große Rolle. The Christian concept of the world meant a lot to him. As did morality. These were the things which he valued. He had thought about becoming a vicar, which the family would have definitely approved of. But on reflection, he decided to join the navy. As I when I reported to Captain Hans Langsdorff, he struck me as someone who'd had a humanistic education. He was somewhat different from the image one had of an officer in the Imperial Navy. Langsdorff's Graf Spee was nicknamed a pocket battleship. It was boasted that she was bigger than anything faster, and faster than anything bigger. Her newly designed diesel engines allowed her to cruise for 16,000 miles without refueling. Bristling with huge 11-inch guns, she was capable of sinking ships 15 miles away. My father must have been really proud and happy to be on such a beautiful ship, not only beautiful to look at, but great in every way. On August the 21st, 1939, Graf Spee sailed quietly away from her base in Wilhelmshaven, Germany. On board were 1,134 crew. 
Her departure was carefully timed so that she would cross the main shipping lanes at night without being spotted. When Britain declared war on September the 3rd, Germany already had an ace hiding in the Atlantic. Her orders were to act as a lone surface raider and to wreak havoc with Allied merchant shipping. Langsdorff's intention was to create as much chaos as he could. So he'd sink something somewhere and then motor away as fast as he could somewhere else to give the impression there was more than one ship and to create as much chaos as possible. In fact, the main aim was not so much the physical damage that was involved in sinking the ships. It was the whole chaos that was inflicted on shipping in this broad area, shipping that was of crucial importance to Britain's survival in the war. On September the 30th, Graf Spee sank the British steamship Clement, but she got off a radio message warning that she was being attacked. News of an unidentified German raider in the South Atlantic was met with swift action at the Admiralty. With merchant shipping vital to the war effort, Churchill made the German raider his number one target. Twenty warships were dispatched to hunt her down. Three of them were under the command of Commodore Henry Harwood. Henry Harwood is possibly the archetypal cruiser Commodore. He knew the area perfectly. He'd served there before the war. He knew it like the back of his hand. And he had thought long and hard before the war about how to deal with pocket battleships in general, when he'd worked at the Naval College at Greenwich, and how to deal with them in particular in South American waters. Langsdorff could not have faced a more formidable opponent. Henry Harwood was a family man who had joined the Navy as a 15-year-old cadet. In 1906, he passed out top of his class and went on to serve in the First World War. He was um, quite sociable. He enjoyed country sports. He was a good golfer. He had a happy knack of getting results by being nice. People trusted him. And his ship's company, I think, always realized that he acquired a high standard and they gave a high standard. Serving under Commodore Harwood was 19-year-old Basil Trott. He was a great skipper. He was a, a great seaman. He decided that when we left England, we were going to be an efficient ship. Didn't matter what time of the day or night it was, if he was up, uh, he would think of something for us to do action stations at midnight, lower a sea boat and try and pick up a life buoy which he'd thrown over the side, lower all the pulling boats and, and row them round the ship. But he also used to stop the ship in mid-Atlantic and say hands to bathe, which was great. You just drop whatever you were doing and leapt over the side. Anyway, by the time we'd uh, been in commission six months, we found he wasn't really a bad old stick. Commodore Harwood and Captain Langsdorff were set on a very public collision course, one which would shape both their destinies. In a deadly game of cat and mouse, Langsdorff continued to hunt Allied merchant shipping. To cause the maximum confusion possible, he now also began to disguise his ship, adding a fake gun turret and an extra funnel. He played his sister ships. In the South Atlantic, he was the Admiral Scheer. In the Indian Ocean, he was the Admiral Graf Spee. He made the Allies think there were a, n a number of German raiders around when there was only one. He played this game, and I think he enjoyed it. Aber er hatte also wohl bei dieser ganzen Kreuzerfahrt auch also. Apparently, during the entire trip, he took great delight in avoiding being found by the English ships. To me, doing that seems almost boyish, even though he was 45 years old by then. Graf Spey next intercepted the Newton Beach, a British merchant ship. 
To keep his position secret, Lan